Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and we'd like to welcome you to our economic summit. My name is Mark Packer, and we are so grateful that you're here uh, to participate with us today. Uh, we would like to welcome uh, all elected officials and other city representatives that are in attendance today. And uh, we are especially grateful uh, to have Natalie Gawker here with us. Natalie has served as Associate Dean of the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah and as a director of the Ken Paul Gardner uh, Policy Institute. She also serves as the Chief Economist for the Salt Lake City Chamber. She serves in the administration, she has served in the administration of uh, three governors, Bangor, Levitt, and Walker, and was a political appointee in the George W. Bush administration. She authors regular columns in the Utah Business Magazine and the Desert News, and co-hosts the weekly radio program, Both Sides of the Aisle, on KCPW. Please join me in welcoming Natalie to the stage. Well, good morning, everybody. Wonderful to join you today. I made the drive from, I live in Murray, and uh, I gotta tell you, I was nervous as I came further south that I would hit blizzard conditions, and it turned out that, this, that it was nicer in Utah County, and, Somehow, every time I come to Utah County, it's nicer than in Salt Lake County, so what's up with that? <laughs> uh, I was chatting with Mark and Matt, uh, Patrick Harris, uh, just getting ready for this, and you know, they have this saying that, uh, don't bury the lead. Tell someone right up front what you're here to share with them, and there's a lot of things to cover and talk about this very uncertain, intriguing time. But I will tell you that there is no better state to be in right now than the state of Utah, and there's really no better county to be in than Utah County. And I'm gonna show you some of that data as we walk through. Uh, I made a presentation uh, following these main points. I'm gonna start out by showing you a risk matrix. These are very uncertain times. Uh, I'm gonna make the case that it's very different here in Utah, and that we are a contrast to other states. Uh, I'm going to talk about Utah's second largest county, Utah County, and uh, some of the significant growth and favorable conditions that are here. I'm going to talk about a serious challenge we face in housing, and then uh, kind of think about what's next. So I hope that that sounds good to you. We often at the Gardner Institute make a, mis a risk matrix. This is uh, one that we've uh, looked at from Moody's Econometrics. But on the horizontal axis at the bottom, it shows what's the severity of the risk, the impact that it could have. And then on the vertical axis, it's the likelihood of the risk. And you can see things there, a crypto crash, a government shutdown, climate change, things like that. But I have highlighted in red the items that we're all kind of focused on. Uh, geopolitical conflict, uh, what's happening at the Russia-Ukrainian border. Uh, Federal Reserve missteps, the potential for that. If this pandemic, which is on the downside, were to have intensification that we're not expected, and uh, could all of these lead to some sort of financial market sell-off? No. That, those are, that's some tough medicine, right? Those are hard things to think about, talk about. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of unknown unknowns. But I couldn't help, as I was pulling this together, to just want to pause for a minute and think about the serious geopolitical challenge that faces our world right now. This is a, a Russian armored vehicle on a, on a highway in Crimea in mid-January. And you know you can just kind of see it's a it's a highway it's part of commerce it's activity and then you see this this stretch of armored vehicles just imagine how that feels uh, there's 190,000 troops at the border that's about 70 percent of the Russian uh, ground troop uh, military this is uh, some of those troops about 90 miles away from the Ukrainian border and then we have these. This is, on the other side, these Ukrainian uh, soldiers on the front lines in what will really be an unfair fight. 
uh, you can have a lot of opinions about our country's response to this, about the EU's response, the UK's response, but I think what we can all agree upon is that this is a very explosive situation. <laughs> the potential for oil prices to spike, the potential for commodity prices to spike, uh, the human suffering death that, that uh, will occur because of uh, something like this. Um, as you know, our country has, has taken um, measures to you know, put out sanctions and they're doing something very uh, carefully here, right? Rather than just throwing out the most extreme sanctions, they're, they're doing it in a process. And so yesterday it was, it was freezing assets. It was um, taking some of the, the more wealthier families in Russia and, and clamping down on their assets. Uh, it was clamping down on foreign debt and different things that start to hurt the country. But, the, but our country, make no mistake, will have more and more serious um, sanctions to come. And then Germany took the move of um, suspending the Nord Stream 2 pipeline which a lot of people didn't think would happen, and it's happened. Uh, and, and so, you know, increasingly the, the Russian people, the Russian government, will feel the pain of a world that says this is not okay. Well, um, I also had on that risk matrix uh, the sting of inflation and what the Federal Reserve uh, confronts as they head into their March meetings. This is showing you a consumer price index, uh, you know, change in it, and so really a common measure of inflation uh, back through uh, the 1950s. So you can kind of see the, the history that we've had, uh, but you can see the spike at the end there. And this uh, spike is absolutely expected coming out of a pandemic when you have so many imbalances, supply shortages, massive amounts of money put out to keep uh, you know, states at full employment. The question is, is will it linger? Will it stay? Is it, is it a one-year thing? Is it a five-year thing? Because inflation is difficult, and as most of you know, the way to combat inflation is to slow down the economy, and if you don't calibrate it right, you create a recession. And that's the major challenge facing uh, policymakers. In that vein, uh, one of the most serious economic challenges we have is this supply chain stress. This is an index that takes about 14 measures of, of supply chain stress, uh, open positions at our ports, uh, you know, shipping uh, constraints, and you can see the stress that pops up there at the very end. And it's starting to, to uh, come down and do a little bit better, but a big part of the inflation story is that everything's become more expensive to buy as inputs and so you raise prices because of your costs going up. We also have a demand side to uh, our inflation, and that is all this federal stimulus that's been put out into the economy. A colleague of mine prepared this data, and the top bar shows the percent of GDP of the stimulus during the not-dot-com recession. The next one shows the percent of GDP stimulus during the Great Recession, and then you see the bottom which approaches 25% of GDP has been put into the U.S. economy in terms of unemployment insurance, uh, paycheck uh, protection, uh, all of the things that our government did to try and keep us whole during uh, a seemingly uh, challenging time that really businesses had no responsibility for. Right? It wasn't anybody's fault, but but uh, there was aid provided. I also had in that risk matrix uh, the idea of a more virulent strain of COVID, and there's something that they're calling stealth Omicron. It's this variant BA.2. Uh, I believe it's in about nine, 10 countries right now. You know, my belief is that each additional variant will have a milder impact both on our economy and our health, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And so this, this stands out there as something that, you know, certainly gives us jitters as we hope to return to something more normal. And then I had you know, shaded in red the idea that potentially, uh, you know, a stock market correction, 
uh, asking the question, are asset prices overdone? This chart basically shows the value of assets owned by households to GDP. So it's a way of thinking of an economy-wide uh, price earnings multiple. And you know, that's, that's really high. And uh, so, does it feel like I'm bringing you a lot of bad news? <laughs> that's why I sort of started by saying, you know, you're in Utah, you're in Utah County, but this is the, this is the, the context. This is the, what, what, we're, what we're, we're challenged with. But there is a really significant Utah difference. And uh, I, you know, I've been studying the Utah economy for about three decades. I've never seen the contrast be as significant as it is right now. So we have the fastest growing state. This is just population from 2010 to 2020, the decennial censuses. And uh, Utah's grown by 18.4%, the nation by 7.4%. So we have all this population growth that drives demand, that, that uh, shows a state filled with opportunity. And you'll note that it's the darker states that are growing fast, and we're right in the center of the fastest growing region. Uh, if we look at job growth and look at over history, the red line there is Utah, and the gray line is the US. Those shaded bars in gray, those vertical bars, are recessions. The width of the bars is the length of the recession. So in the middle, you see that kind of faded gray. That's the Great Recession, a long recession. You can see what happens to job growth during recessions, and look at the very end or the far right. Uh, look at the pandemic recession, very much a V-shaped, just the bottom dropped out, you know, layoffs, you know, shutdowns, whatever, popping back up. But I want you to notice how the red line never gets as low as the gray line during the, during the drop off in the pandemic. And then see how quickly we pop up and how we stay at a higher level. So much so that if we look at job growth, and this is common practice now in economics, we do a two-year percent change. So where were we in 2019 before the pandemic, and where are we today in 2021? This map is showing you December of 2019 to December of 2021, pandemic in the middle, forget about that, just where are we at those two points in time, and calculates the growth rates. And you'll see uh, that Utah with a 3.7% growth, uh, the nation is a negative 1.8. So that's, I mean, just imagine doing your business in an environment where the economy is contracting by 1.8% as opposed to growing by 3.7%. And if you look at the map, um, you can see that Idaho, Utah, Arizona, and Texas are the only states in the country that's job base has grown in the last two years. That's really, I think it's the most uh, interesting graphic that I'll show you today. If we look at the, the, the broad-based nature of Utah's uh, employment growth right now, construction leading the way with a 12.4% growth rate begs the question, where are they finding the workers, right? How are you growing at 12.4%? This is a job measure, so this is a people count. Uh, you can see financial activity, manufacturing, trade, uh, professional business services, all these uh, sectors with very strong growth rates. Uh, in decline, still our tourism sector, leisure and hospitality, although it looks much better than it did uh, a few months ago. And then the mining sector at a minus 8%, which will likely have a serious correction with higher oil prices at this point. Okay, so I'm moving along, right? And saying we have a risk matrix, a lot of uncertainty. Utah is differentiated from the rest of the states. And now we're gonna jump to Utah County. And I was down here in 2018, I think, and I showed you this graphic, and I said, the rise of Utah County, we put it on the cover of the Utah Economist magazine, and boy, is it holding true. A colleague of mine, Juliet Tenner, put together this data, and I think it's so, so telling. So this is indexed employment, uh, you know, post-Great Recession and the pandemic recession recoveries. So you, make, you take uh, the Provo metro area, the state of Utah and the United States, and you put them on an index and you say, okay, in January of 07, where were you? And then we just show, where's your growth been? And you can see the Provo Orem just rising, um, unlike the US and very much above the, the state. And you can see you have a, a V-shaped drop, but you're at such a higher level than the state and the US, you are absolutely uh, leading in this economy. 
this is a little dated, but it was the best data I had at the moment uh, to show you that we pride ourselves in Utah with having the fastest growing economy. We are not the fastest growing economy without the Provo or a Metro. That's how significant your growth is. And I had some fun here and put it in blue just to make you all feel better. <laughs> Um, but you see that, right? We're, this is for a, a period of time, August 19 to August of 2021, so the two year again. We have the fastest growth, but if we pull out the Provo Warren, we drop to number two. Another way to look at it, um, here is the two year growth rates for the U.S., the state of Utah, and our four big metro counties. And look, I got you in blue again, but look at Utah County. You know, I have to put on my glasses to get this right, but 8% uh, job growth over two years compared to the state at 3.7 and compared to your neighbor uh, to the north, uh, Salt Lake County at one and a half. Utah County has so much um, activity, energy, momentum, uh, potential. Uh, one of your biggest differences is you have buildable land supply in close proximity to economic opportunity. And so in Salt Lake County, you're almost getting the point where you can only build up. And in Utah County, you've got green fields to grow in. Makes a huge difference. This is not, uh, doesn't show that, but this is the unemployment rates. And uh, you can just see how you're able to sustain very high job growth with a very low unemployment rate. If we look at Utah County's uh, demographics and population change, uh, here I've done a switcheroo on you, I put you back to red, but 30%, uh, a third of the state's growth last year came in this county. Uh, Salt Lake County had 16%, so you're contributing you know, twice as much in share as the state's largest county. And uh, in these two maps, uh, on, the, on the left, you're seeing the absolute change in population, and on the right, you're seeing the percent change. So let me have you focus on the right, and I'll just call out a couple of things here. Uh, the fastest growing county last year was Iron County, where Cedar City is, so that's kind of far away. But the second fastest growing county uh, would put you right, well, you have what's going on in Southwest, but when you come up north to Willow County, Wasatch County, in Utah County are the dominant growth areas. And I want to highlight uh, the Heber Valley for just a minute. Wasatch County was, um, it, it grew by about 50% between the censuses. Just imagine that in 10 years to hit about 48% growth. Uh, it's no um, mystery to me that that growth is very much related to Utah County and the close uh, proximity to the economic engine that is the county. So I just find, uh, the growth that you're experiencing is super interesting. Now, I'm gonna have some fun here for just a minute thinking about Central Bank, because it's got the term central, right? And we do this thing in, in demographics where we measure the population center of the state. So you have to think of a, of a rigid plane, flat rigid plane that's balancing, and if everybody in the state weighed the same, where would it balance? That's the mean population center. So this, this shows that uh, starting in 1960, I hope you can kind of see, uh, actually starting in 1950. In 1950, it was in uh, the Draper portion of Utah County near Suncrest Drive. By 1960, largely because of Davis County's growth as a bedroom community, it shifted uh, north to Sandy, kind of in the Hidden Valley Country Club area. Then after 1970, the relentless shift south um, and eventually southwest started to happen. You can see it kind of moving, you can see this line. Uh, by 1980, it's in Cherry Canyon near Draper. And today, it's in the Harvest Hills area of Saratoga Springs. So the Utah population shifting south and making it so the navel of the state, where Central Bank is headquartered, <laughs> is uh, right here in this county. So I just thought you'd find that interesting. Uh, okay, well, so now we've also got some challenges. So, lots of challenges in the, in the global context, the national context. Utah uh, has significant tailwinds relative to other states. Utah County also has these significant tailwinds. But we have this challenge 
in that one more time. We have this challenge <coughs> in Utah that's associated with housing, and my colleague Dayan Eskich took this photograph. This shows the incredible amount of construction occurring, and I showed you that in the job growth. Then we have homelessness, and then this interesting sign here that says, we buy houses, um, you know, cash. And it's this, it's this dynamic, right, of, of record building, record permits, socioeconomic uh, divides, uh, a large homeless population, and um, the, the idea of, of speculation starting to happen in our state housing market in a, in a more significant way. So here's the quarterly increase, year over quarterly increase in housing prices. And you can see Utah and Idaho showing up there, Idaho with the highest over this time period, but Utah the second fastest increase. If we just isolate Utah and look at it over time, you see this really stunning uh, price appreciation. Look at the tail end there with a 28.3% year over quarterly percent change for the most recent data. Unsustainable, record level, um, and we're, as you know, the place where it's really difficult is for the new homeowners who want to enter into ownership. We have a whole cohort of Utahns that are not able to break in to this very expensive housing market, and they will feel the effects of not having home ownership by delaying that. They won't be accumulating wealth, and it will it will it will definitely affect their wealth accumulation as a as a cohort. So that's you know super concerning. If we look at housing prices in 2021 by county, I've got Utah County in blue there, but a 26.8 percent jump, the highest of the uh, metro counties. And you know we don't want to just look at uh, housing prices. We want to look at other measures that show the tightness of the market. But this is the median days on the market of residential units in our state. You can see it got as low as five days. It's now hovering around 10 days. But if you put a home on the market, you list it, it will sell within 10 days at this point. Showing a super uh, tight and in, in so many ways stressed market. And it's not just home ownership, it affects rent. So this is the rent in the Wasatch Front uh, major metro counties. And here you can see Utah County. It's the gray in this chart, but it's the highest one with a 16.8% annual percent change in the average rental rate. So housing um, being the uh, most significant challenge that I'm gonna sort of throw out there for you to think about. Uh, we can also look at vacancy rates in urban Utah. You can see this steady, steady drop, um, Utah County in gray, but all of them sort of stand at about the same level of a, two, of a, of a you know, roughly 2% vacancy rate, which is, of course, why all of you are building so many apartments and why we see so many built, because we need to build, build, build. Um, our, our team at the Gardner Institute tries to estimate the housing imbalance each of these bars shows you the comparison between new households created and new housing units built. When the black bar is above the red bar, that means we're building more housing units than forming new households. And you can see how they're, they're pretty close, but in every decade, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, we built enough homes to accommodate new household growth. When we come into the 2010s, Note how the red bar now is higher than the black bar at the beginning of the decade. And then if you look along the bottom, you've got accumulating housing shortage. It gets a little better towards the end of the decade, but we stand today about 45,000 units short of what the market demands. Hence, price increases, lower days on the market, rent increases. This is the housing gap challenge. So the last uh, thing I wanna share I'm gonna to talk to you for about five, uh, 10 more minutes, then I'll open it up for questions. But I, I just wanna think about what's next. And what I've tried to paint is uncertainty in the world, lots of great things happening in Utah, Utah County. What, what, are, what are we confronting? What do we face? And I'm just giving an ingredient here as, as thinking about that. You know, we've had where we've been with COVID, the federal stimulus, social unrest, January 6th, the Omicron inflation above target. But if you look forward, um, 
Think about Ukraine. Think about a Roe v. Wade decision that's going to be made. <coughs> Think about a new uh, Supreme Court appointment. Think about the rate hikes, midterm elections. What is it we don't know about? A black swan. I have bounty and spread on there. That's the idea that the information economy rewards some people, but not all. So you have a lot of bounty, but you also have a lot of spread in the distribution of income. When you think of, of, the, of inflation, this is, this is the plan. This is what the Fed is trying to do. They've had this uptick inflation, and they want to work it down by 2023 to their target level, averaging around 2%. And they expect to do a rate hike in March. They've signaled that, 25 basis points. It's the working assumption. You'll see another one in July. You'll see one in September, maybe one in December, right? So for every quarter, a 25 basis points rate increase. That's the working assumption could be different. Okay, now I'm gonna get a little bit provocative. <laughs> and as I do it, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, it. I'm trying to kind of push some buttons, um, but it's, it's, it's the reason I'm trying to, <laughs> I've, got the, I've got the Packards nervous at this point. <laughs> but the reason I wanna push some buttons, and I, I, wanna, I wanna read to you something that an editorial, um, a house editorial read in the Week magazine. And it, it gives you a sense of what's, what's brewing, what think people are thinking about. But just, if it pushes any buttons for you, just know that I'm also gonna read something from our Speaker of the House to give you this balance as we think about it. I'm gonna put it up on screen so you can read it if you want, but I'm gonna read it to you. But this was on December 31st, 2021, so the end of last year. Uh, William Falk is the editor of the Week magazine, and he wrote this. He said, this is a dark time in a dark year. It began horribly with a violent assault on the Capitol intended to stop the peaceful transfer of power, a first for our nation. The climate, here he's talking about climate change. The climate showed us where we're headed as biblical droughts baked the West and sucked reservoirs dry. 115 degree heat waves paralyzed Portland and Seattle and a polar cold snap froze Texas solid. Forests in the western U.S. exploded into flames. Monstrous tornadoes, almost never seen in December, erased communities across Kentucky and the Midwest. The pandemic, we thought we'd beaten in the spring, roared back twice through Greek-lettered, mutation-disguised variants that have filled hospitals and morgues with voluntarily unvaccinated. In this season of renewal and hope, it takes real effort to find optimism about the future in our sour, beleaguered hearts. Now he goes on, clever writing here, again, tr trying to be provocative, which I'm sure he is. We can reasonably hope the pandemic will wane this year at last, after holding humanity hostage for more than two years. But there's no reason to expect an end to another <coughs> viral epidemic of misinformation and tribal hatred that endangers our democracy. Americans no longer share common facts, information, or trusted sources and experts. Extremists on both sides are pushing the parties further apart. In the face of so many troubles and sorrows, what do we do? And then he says, for perspective, I often think back to what my parents' generation faced and how dark it must have felt as 1941 gave way to 1942. Then, as now, surrender was not an option. Curse the darkness, fight, persist. The light is coming eventually. Okay, this, I mean, I read that, uh, you know, in early January and I'm like, wow, that, that's a perspective. And it's a dark perspective. Last night, the Wheatley Institution at Big Brigham Young University had uh, a rabbi uh, speak at an event and I watched some of it live stream. <coughs> and the rabbi essentially said that every generation thinks that their generation is facing something harder than the previous generation. You know, World War II, Vietnam War, Civil War, whatever it was. He said, the only difference is this time we're right. <laughs> I was like, whoa. I, I didn't finish the live stream. <laughs> I found something else to do. So I wanted to just give you my best thinking. Um, and th this, I'm gonna get more philosophical here, but my best thinking is we all need to practice warm-heartedness. There's too much contempt in our society. Uh, Arthur Brooks, someone I follow a lot, talked to the Dalai Lama, said, 
what do you do when you feel contempt? And he says, practice warm-heartedness. I just think we need to give each other more grace. I do think that we can respect facts and employ reason. There are indisputable facts that we should all not argue with and kind of work through, right? Incentives matter. Um, taxes stifle uh, activity. Um, the, the surface temperature of the earth is rising. We can disagree on the reasons for it or what to do, but the surface temperature of the earth is rising. That's a fact. So respect facts, deploy reason. And then the third one is to seek balance. Now this would come no surprise coming from me as someone who um, you know, sort of operates in the productive middle. But uh, my boss, President Taylor Rand at the University of Utah, says when you, when you focus on one thing, you lose perspective. And I think of picking up a, a stone and putting it so close to your eye, and you only see the stone, you don't see everything around it. It was a point he made during the pandemic because we were so focused on public health, we forgot to think about public education and about the economy. You know, so you have to, you have to keep uh, balance in the way you think about things. So that's my best thinking. I have um, two more slides. Uh, a couple of rec recommended strategies for you and your business. Probably a little bit more philosophical as well, but we go a lot of places with this. Do be prepared for an economic resorting. That absolutely happens after a pandemic. In, in a pandemic, you do not go back. You walk through a door and you're into a different world. And the economic resorting has characteristics like this. Uh, the way people work will be forever changed. Remote work has proven in the information jobs, in the knowledge workers, to be a very successful way to work. Doesn't mean people won't be in offices, but it means that we will have much more of a hybrid environment, and that'll change some things. Economic resorting can mean Zoom towns, right? It can mean that Midway, um, Alpine, um, let's do uh, Price, Utah. You can live in places and work even though your headquarters for your job is somewhere else. It creates Zoom town. So those are, that's economic resorting. Demographic change, economic structural change, behavioral change that change the world moving forward. Think of your businesses, prepare for that. I have take care of yourself and your people. That's because this has been a really hard time. Uh, the mental health indicators in our state are just troubling, particularly for our youth. Uh, so take care of yourself and uh, those you love, your employees. Care for those left behind. The pandemic and, and the information age is creating spread. It's leaving people behind. Um, if you don't have a post-secondary degree in the, in the trades, in a four degree, sorry, a four year uh, degree program, this economy will leave you behind. And so we, we need to care for those left behind. It, it means reinventing our welfare system. It means changing things. And then invest in institutions. This is this idea that you can't just continually fray um, the Supreme Court, um, higher education, uh, religious affiliation. I'm thinking of institutions, the durable forms of human life, the things we do together. You can't just constantly uh, create more distrust of uh, fray uh, these institutions and expect us to have uh, an orderly law-abiding society. So we have to invest in our institutions. So with that, I'm happy to take questions about it, but I wanted to have a, a uh, contrasting quote to the, the week editor, and I chose uh, Brad Wilson, our House Speaker, who in his address, uh, addressing the legislature at the start of the session, he said, it is said the pessimist complains about the wind. I've done a bit of complaining today. The optimist expects it to change and the realist adjusts the sale. With deliberation, with cooperation, and with determination, we can create a future we all want. Let's be bold as we chart the Utah way forward. So the weak guy said, oh, eventually we'll see the light. Speaker Wilson says, we're bold. We create our future onward. So with that, I hope I've created enough um, stimulating things to think about. Uh, Seth has got a microphone, there, there's some other microphones here, but I am going to be bold and take uh, about 20 minutes of your questions. And it's really daunting when you have a crowd like this that can hit you with anything, but I'll do my very best. <laughs> so, who's got a question? We have two microphones, one over there. Just <clears throat> raise your hand if you have a question and we'll deliver the mic. By the way, these, these slides, 
and this video will be posted to our website later today. So with this unprecedented government spending, with our, what's our deficit as a percentage of GDP and what's the impact to our economy from that? Mm, yeah. Well, it's too high. <laughs> and as you know, there's both debt related to GDP and deficit related to GDP. But, and then there's you know, different ways of measuring publicly held debt and whatnot. But here's how I think about it. Um, we made a big mistake during the longest expansion in our nation's history to not bring our debt down. We were expanding. We just have come through that longest expansion. And during that expansion, we continued to grow our debt. And that was a big mistake. So now we have a once in a hundred year type crisis and we've got to care for our people. So we borrow a lot more money. So now we're in a situation where we have to go take care of it. Um, now, some people, reasonable people disagree on, on this, but I'm in the camp of we need to do both spending and tax changes to get on top of our, our debt. Um, I like to think of it like termites in a house, right? The debt is just doing its thing. And eventually you pay a very dear price. And as interest rates rise and our payment on the debt rises, we crowd out other important spending for our nation. Um, I think we should reform Social Security. I think we should reform Medicare. I think we should reform Medicaid, so our entitlements, and, uh, and also find ways to um, not put all of this uh, uh, spending on our children, all the payback on our children. So big problem. We need to do something on it. Hi, good morning. Thank you uh, for your presentation. You bet. Uh, my name is Marlon Lindsay. I'm founder and CEO of 21st and Ed. Um, uh, question for you. Uh, I noticed that in the Utah recovery, uh, the tech sector is not highlighted. Mm -hmm. And with uh, Silicon Slopes booming and folks just moving to the state for technology, uh, what role is that playing in the recovery? Or, and and in, in, in general, what, what role does the tech sector play in yeah, thank you, Marlon, for the question. Uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because it should have been emphasized more. And one of the reasons it's not really apparent is the tech sector crosses so many industries. So if I show my chart of our broad-based expansion, you'll see manufacturing doing well. Some of that's tech. You know, you'll see financial services doing well. FinTech, right? You'll see some of that. And so it doesn't neatly, in, in, in the information age, uh, tech does not fall neatly into our traditional industry characterizations. Uh, but it's absolutely a huge part of our economic success and of Utah County's economic success. And the best statistic I can give you top of mind is we've calculated from Midvale to Pleasant Grove, just one definition of Silicon Slopes, Midvale to Pleasant Grove, what percentage of the state's jobs, have, you know, since 2010 have been in that area, and it's about 40%. Yeah, and so, so they're not only, you know, it's, it's, it's the growth center, but it's high wage growth, and it's, um, so you'll often hear our governor talk about Utah has a very diverse economy. Uh, in the 1980s, we were not diverse. And starting with Word Perfect and Novell and iOmega, we started to uh, diversify. We're now getting so tech heavy that we might become less diversified. <laughs> so, but you're absolutely uh, on point to bring that up. Okay, probably let's go over here. Anyone? Thank you. I read a little snippet from an economist last night that said the Fed is, I want to say, 30% accurate over the last 12 years trying to manage inflation and their monetary policy. So so what thoughts do you have on what's really going to happen with inflation and, and what the Fed is doing and how that may or may not work? And then what could we do in our industry or here in this county to try to prepare for and, and work through the inflation that's coming and I think here to stay for a while. Yeah. So th this is where I go when I think about inflation. I think about what are the causes 
and then I want to go think about each of those causes. So let's do the supply side first. Um, so you have, you know, a broken supply chain that has made all of the inputs more expensive, and that causes you to raise prices. The supply chain will be fixed. <laughs> you know, there's too much money to be made in fixing it. Uh, we will figure that out. Now, you might remember if I showed you inflation did this and then it came back down after Delta and then it took off again after Omicron. And Omicron hit uh, Southeast Asia really hard and much of our supply chain originates in Southeast Asia. And so if, if you can keep the pandemic under control and you don't have shut down factories again and, and, and people are healthy and they're going to work and different things that, and, and then you know supply and demand fixes the supply chain, we'll take care of the supply side. So now we go to the demand side. That's where you're putting money out and stimulating demand. Uh, boy, this one's varied or, or complex. We have pent up demand because during the pandemic we didn't get to do things. So we want to go travel and things that pops prices up. We have excess savings. Um, Central bank will know that their deposits are way up. It's consistent in all of the banking sector. People didn't have things to spend, they've saved. So now they gotta spend down their excess savings. And then you have, uh, until very recently, we have the stock market's done very well. So you have this wealth effect. And then stimulus. Then you have the stimulus, 25% of GDP. Arguably a lot more stimulus than the state of Utah needed. Look at our economic numbers. But if you look at the rest of the country, um, you can make a reasonable argument that, that the employment situation was dire and they needed help, at least in some areas. So are, are those temporary? Well, excess savings will be spent, uh, pent-up demand will be spent, eventually the stimulus gets spent. The question is how much of it gets embedded in what they'll call a wage price spiral, where it gets embedded in wages, uh, so there's a lot of demand for things, so prices rise and it, it spirals. The Fed knows these things extremely well. They're the best in the world at figuring this out. But even though they're the best in the world, they don't have a great track record. <laughs> so uh, my best guess, and this is what the state economists are forecasting, I actually do think we get it under control, but that doesn't happen until 2023. We'll have another year of high inflation. And um, the big risk is as they try to get under control, do they create a recession? And that's a reasonable thing to worry about. But the mainstream opinion is we'll get these rate increases and they will figure out how to land this plane and how to combat inflation. But it's there's a 30, 40% chance that they don't get it right. You, you make point it could be higher. Sorry, I can't do any better than that. I hope it helps you though, just thinking through the components. One over here and then second right here. Okay. Um, my question, hello, is how much of a recession do you think is kind of based on public opinion and people's view of the world and world affairs versus macroeconomic factors that are truly out of our control? Is that kind of question? I feel yeah. like the attitude in Utah County is very bullish and very positive. And how much of that could beat you know, wars and things like that that could cause recession? Right. Yeah, great. Question, um, you know, the Utah legislature did something interesting. When the pandemic hit, uh, we know we have a consumer-based economy, and they wanted to know what's in the minds of consumers, and we had no tool to understand consumer sentiment. You'll always hear about consumer confidence at the national level, the Michigan survey, different things, but we didn't have it for Utah. And so, you know what the legislature did? They funded a consumer confidence survey, which our state now does every single month. We have now 13 months of data, and uh, I think your question is spot on. Like if I'm trying to do my um, business forecast, I absolutely want to know what's going on in the minds of consumers. And what we find, so what our state does is, the University of Michigan has the Michigan uh, Consumer Sentiment Survey, it's the standard. Uh, so now our state replicates the exact same questions, but for Utah, and does it at the same time, you know, in the middle of the month, publishes at about the same time, and you can see the U.S. and U.S. What does it tell you? Our consumer sentiment's much higher than the U.S. It still um, hasn't returned to pre-pandemic times. 
And uh, one other thing I think you'll find interesting is it's been responsive. So uh, in March of last year, it got really um, high because of the vaccine and everything. And then with Delta, it dropped. And then with Omicron, it dropped. <laughs> and we're now working our way back up. If you want to see that uh, data, uh, if you go to gardner.utah.edu, that's the website of the institute I lead, under the survey research, you'll see a link to the Utah Consumer Sentiment Survey. So super important and something we ought to be looking at, and uh, it does, um, it can be self-fulfilling, you still have to deploy facts and reason, but it's very important. There's a reason President Biden has been telling us for weeks that this was going to happen, and that he said that the targets kid, and that he's saying that oil prices are gonna rise. He's, he's inoculating us with the bad news that's coming. <laughs> because he's trying to affect consumer sentiment. So Howard. Yeah, I, I, I was a little surprised to see the energy price shock um, where you have it on your risk chart. Okay. Given oh, do you think it should be higher? Well, given its relationship to all those other things, I just, I'd just i love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, you know what, Howard, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to yield to you. You're right. <laughs> it should change. I made that risk matrix before, like, two weeks ago. And last night I moved the geopolitical up and I should have moved the, uh, the oil price. Because here, here's what happens. Um, the, the, the oil price, as you know, is very visible to the American consumer. And so it affects confidence. Now, we're an energy state. This is part of the magic of a diverse economy. Not every state. There's probably only 10, 12 states that can say they're an energy state. We are. When oil prices rise, uh, it helps us. So it's it's complicated that way, and I'm, I'm I'm waiting to ask someone, but I think copper prices are going to rise, you know, and silver, and so some of these things will rise because of um, these sanctions, and might be good for Utah. Do you like that I just yielded to Howard? <laughs> I know my audience in that case. <laughs> I'm changing that chart. Yes, please. challenge in Utah, which is our housing shortage, and the gap where you said we need 45,000 new home units to catch up with the demand. So my question is, can we continue to just grow out to areas that are undeveloped, like to the south, to the west of Utah, Canada, the Saratoga Springs, and Payson, or will we need to maybe be a little bit like Salt Lake County, where they've kind of built out horizontally, and they've started to build higher with more density upwards? And if so, um, what's the balance between responsibility of what cities are supposed to be doing versus the state? Because we're seeing that in cities, the state legislature, legislature putting on requirements of, of density uh, across the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, you all heard that question. That is a really tough one. And um, I, I guess I would just respond by saying that from an economic point of view, we need supply. We need housing units built. Um, related to that is the regulatory burden that falls on builders to try and meet that demand. And the state legislature, I, I shouldn't speak for them, but as an observer, what I observe is that they know this is a state issue that is very much controlled by local land use planning. And they want to do everything they can to make sure that local government um, helps solve the problem and is not part of the problem. So they, they, you know, they incentivize things, they penalize things, they change things, but I, I have a really strong conviction that if we don't meet housing demand, something will give. <laughs> and in our state, it's typically the legislature will weigh in. Now, um, one other way to think about that is that do not think, I, I don't think it's reasonable to think that we can be a 3.4 million strong state and feel like we're a one and a half million state. <laughs> like we, our, our expectations about housing and the way we live and the way we get around must change as we grow. Uh, I, I'll give you a factoid that you'll find interesting. The state of Utah is now the 30th largest state in the country. For my entire career, we were 34th. 
And it wasn't until the 2020 census that we became 30th. We jumped four states. If you take 50 states and divide them into thirds, you know, large states, medium size, and small, we're in the medium sized state category now. That, that, that's not how we think of ourselves. We think of ourselves as a small western interior state, but we are 30th. Um, do you know that the state of Utah, racially and ethnically, is more diverse than the state of Ohio? More diverse than Missouri? More diverse than Michigan? No, 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 not Michigan. Uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin? That really surprises people. But we are diverse, urban, rapidly growing, changing in front of our eyes. And so those housing pressures are very real. And local government and the tension with um, the state will continue to rise in my judgment. Those of you that are in local government, thanks for your service. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. I don't know a whole lot about the cryptocurrency. But based on the Super Bowl, I feel like I need to know more. <laughs> um, but with that, I just want to kind of know what it is, basically, and how it could positively influence or negatively influence the economy yeah. going forward. I was at uh, LA Live during the Rose Bowl when the, the University of Utes uh, you know, played Ohio State, and uh, I noted that that was right when the stadium changed there, when staples became crypto or whatever. So, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, listen, um, uh, cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Um, they, um, they have some advantages. They're very efficient. There's not a middle man. Some people like the secrecy. Um, but they're also very volatile and risky. Um, but I don't think for a minute that it's a passing uh, trend. But I, I don't think it becomes um, a mainstream part of our currency. Any time, in any of our lifetimes. I think it's always going to be, well, for the foreseeable future, a niche currency. But it's for real, right? I mean, you just look at the volumes. It's for real. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, do you have any recommended, like, best business practices, like, in case of a recession? Like, is there any data on, like, Great Depression and then the 2008 crash about, like, specific things that businesses can do to, like, combat a recession, and especially because like, if a recession is less likely, are there things you can do that work especially well in, in good markets, but also kind of combat recession markets? Yeah. You know, I don't have any advice that's much different than a, than a household, you know, save for a rainy day, um, keep an eye on the market, act quickly, you know, to cut costs and, and do what you need to do. Um, create value in everything you do. The market always rewards uh, value. And um, diversify. Those are, those, that's sort of the rules of thumb. Okay, get close here. I have maybe, a maybe question more? back here on the Let's website. See, um, you usually talk about economic growth for the state of Utah, kind of a dip a toe in the water is where, where we can look to see the next year will go. I, you have, that's absent from your presentation today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're asking, like, what's the short-term forecast? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So last year, at the beginning of the year, I heard Jim say that it was going to, it wouldn't go past 10. I heard him later in the fall say, oh, we're going to hit 10 to 12 for this year. But you didn't say anything about it today. Yeah, okay. Listen, you know what I would do, and, and I can send this to Seth if you'd like, but there is a golden document that is the state's short-term forecast. And it's the state's short-term forecast for migration, for interest rates, for inflation, uh, copper prices. It's all the salient indicators that feed into our state budget work on forecasting revenues, just like you forecast for your business. Fits on an eight and a half by 11 page, and I can send that to Seth and you can share it with him. It's, it's kind of a nerdy document, right? It's all numbers. But it will have the state's forecast for dwelling units, and it's, and it's pretty interesting. Let me give you an example. On inflation, what everyone's asking about, 4.7% in 21, 4.5% in 22, and 2 point, I think it's 3% in 23. So the state forecast has it high this year, but it has it getting back to target in 2023. So anyway, I'll make that available to you, because it's not, uh, the only reason I didn't include it here um, You know, if you put it in words, um, 
we have an amazing 2021. I don't know if I, I didn't emphasize that enough, but we created over 70,000 jobs in the Utah economy. We had to get 20,000 to get back to where we were, and then we went ahead and created 50,000 more. <laughs> so it was a, really a banner year in 2021. And uh, as we go into 2022, the forecast is for a strong year, but with significant risks. Okay, let's do one more. So on the housing shortage, you talked about how there is a housing shortage, but yet with the rise of interest rates and the rise of costs, it seems like there's more of an affordable housing shortage. Um, can you talk about a way to combat the rise in interest rates as well as the rise in costs and yet still make things affordable? Yeah. You know, when I ask our housing uh, experts what they think, they they basically say it's going to take us a lot of time to build our way out of this, and then they even use a decade. Now it depends on the market and you know the sub markets and whatnot, but we have a significant gap, and it is most acute on the um, on the, the new home buyer uh, price uh, level. So what do we do about it? Um, the state is investing significantly in housing preservation. Um, they're doing what they can to, to strengthen the Aileen Walker Housing Trust Fund. So they're really focused on the lower income housing needs in our state. Um, I think that uh, the rising interest rates are a given. I think that's not something we're gonna change. This will, you know, this is kind of has to work over the long term. But I think one of the best things we can do is is have a workforce that's well educated that can afford these homes, that can be in the jobs, that can make it work. Um, but the most important thing we need is supply. We need to build units, and so anything we can do at the local government state government and collaboratively in the private sector to get units built that's the best solution we can find okay hey you all have been great i hope that i shared something that uh, at least got you thinking